folks, good morning and welcome to Board Game Breakfast from the Dice Tower. Well, uh, hopefully if you live in the United States, except for a couple of the states, we've lost an hour over the weekend. It's now daylight savings time, so let's try not to waste any of your catching up on that hour time here. So we're going to get into the news in just a moment. Before we do, just a reminder that many of the shows and our videos, you can find just the audio at DicetowerAudio.com. So if you don't have time to watch this and you just want to listen to it, that is often available there. Anyhow, let's get to the news. In the news, first from Stronghold Games, we have Stronghold and Mesa Board Games have been working together to produce Panamax, which is the 100th anniversary commemorative game for the Panama Canal. Uh, so in this game, you're trying to move your ships through the different locks of the canal, while at the same time, hopefully not helping other ships move through the canal. Sounds somewhat interesting. Fantasy Flight Games uh, has announced some expansions for Disc Wars, which came out at the end of 2013. We have Hammer and Hold, which is going to introduce dwarfs that will make a lot of people happy, I'm sure. And the Legions of Darkness, which sounds so pleasant, and that will introduce Undead. So, so some more armies. And each of those uh, expansions, from what I can tell, adds some more units for the original game also. On Board Game Geek, they have the Golden Geek Awards, which they usually they used to vote on over the summer. Now they're voting on at the beginning of the year. They have announced their awards, and you can find a complete list of them at the Board Game Geek website. The big winner overall was Terra Mystica, which is, even though it wasn't necessarily my cup of tea, certainly is a game that I can see a lot of people liking, and with the Board Game Geek crowd, a very, very heavy Euro game. So um, uh, other ones, Tash Kalar won a Best Abstract Game, which shows how low the ball was in Abstract Games last year. X-Wing won two-player. Robinson Crusoe won thematic. And Love Letter had somewhat of a sweep where it won best card game, best party game, best family game, and best innovative game. Um, so that's interesting. We'll come back to Love Letter in a bit. Adventure Time Card Wars uh, from Cryptozoic. There's a couple packs of that. I'll be doing a review of that hopefully in a week or two. Uh, they had some starter packs and it was like built like a collectible card game, but uh, Cryptozoic has now announced that it actually is going to be a collectible card game uh, with 100 cards in the first set and such. There's some, you know, furor about this. I don't really see how it's that big of a deal. You buy it or you don't. Um, Galaxy Defenders is coming out later in March. Uh, so that game I previewed earlier, a very big um, game where you have some people who've landed on a planet and aliens are coming out and you have to blow them all up with cool miniatures and things. And we've seen some more pictures of the portal board game from Cryptozoic. Um, I like the little cake pieces. And we can see that basically Valve was already developing the game from what we can understand. And so they, they gave it to uh, Cryptozoic for that final level of polish. It will be interesting to see what the final game looks like. All right, thank you, Nick. Let's go now. I'm going to be putting upcoming games and new releases together because there's only a few games that are upcoming. The expansion for the Walking Dead game from Cryptozoic and the Timeline games uh, will be coming out hopefully this week. Music and Cinema. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to like combining all these Timeline games together at some point. Games that were released last week, well, there was the second expansion for Darkest Night. The Once Upon a Time 3rd Edition came out. Very, you know, this very popular storytelling game. If you like storytelling games, that's one that you would want to check out. Concept, although at the time of this, I was looking at that like, ooh, Concept, but it's already sold out. But it might come back. Island Siege, Continental Express, Tessin. Um, uh, which is a new little game. I just got that in the mail the other day. Al Rashid, which is a very interesting kind of in-your-face Euro game. Volt, and I wanted to pause here and say that Volt was one of the sponsors of our Kickstarter, and a shout-out to them. Uh, Volt, by the way, is a game that I reviewed uh, a couple weeks ago. It's a robot battle arena game, and it is really a fantastic family-style robot battle game. If you play like Robo Rally and sometimes got frustrated with the different programming things, here you can, that can happen a little bit, but it's kind of what you do, how it affects the other players and trying to outguess them. A very, very good game. Uh, we are dead in Settlers of the Multiverse Vengeance. The bad guys are mad, so they've made their own evil Justice League style team and they're coming back to fight you. All right, well, let's take a look at a couple games and one on the iOS. Quantum. This is a game of tactical space exploration and warfare for two to four players. 
You start the game with three spaceships that are represented by three big dice. The number of the dice determines what kind of ship it is and how fast it can move. On your turn, you can use three actions to reroll any of your ships, move and then attack, add one to the dice research station, or construct quantum cubes. When your ship starting a planet equals the number on the board, you can spend two actions to place the cube. When all your cubes have been placed, you win the game. You can also take a more compact supremacy approach. When you move in the same space as another ship, you can attack them. You roll the battle dice and add that number to your ship's size. The lowest number wins. The destroyed ship is moved to the scrapyard and the winner moves the dominance dice up one level, or the other down one level. When it reaches six, you get to place a quantum cube on the board. This is a fantastic game with great interaction, great for anyone who wants to try a space exploration style game. Out of five, we give this game a five. Hi, Suzanne here with a look at this week's featured board game app. iOS is the simplest platform to look at when we're talking about board game apps because it has the largest selection of official ports. But other platforms are doing great things in the board game world as well. Today, I thought we'd take a look at a game that's been implemented on multiple platforms, including Android and iOS, Nuroshima Hex. Nuroshima Hex? Nuroshima? Nuroshima? Let's take a look. In Nuroshima Hex, you control a unique army struggling for dominance in an ages-long war set in a dystopian future. Destroy your opponent's headquarters for ultimate victory by using your units and modules for ranged and melee attacks. The variety in armies and the dynamics of the tile drawing and battle tiles ensure a different experience every game. The app versions of Nuroshima Hex have nice consistency of features as the development for each platform was executed by the same development group, Big Daddy's Creations. The game has thorough tutorials, AI, and online play. The game's been out for a little while now, so there aren't as many people hanging out waiting to pick up an online game, but you can always play with a friend. The presentation is polished, including sharp graphics that I think look better on the screen than even on the physical board. I really enjoy this game digitally. In fact, I learned how to play the game from the app as opposed to a table version. And arguably, the app versions are easier to play in that they make calculating the attack order, range, and hits automatic, whereas that can take a bit of time in the physical game. Sometimes rotating the tiles can be a bit fiddly on the screen, but there's an undo button, and the overall execution is smart and smooth. The game has been consistently supported with new armies added as in-app purchases, extending its replayability significantly. The price of the app and the IAP vary between platforms, but it does go on sale once in a while. Nuroshima Hex is an exciting tactical board game that plays great on a mobile device. Give it a try. One Hit Wonders is a section where I talk about games that were on my top 100 list at one point, and now they no longer on for whatever reason. Well, I'm about to tell you the reasons. Now, this is not as big of a deal as it seems because I have played 35 to 400 to 4,000 games. And so being in my top 100 is pretty impressive because I like my top 1,000, 2,000 games. So just because a game fell out of the top 100 isn't that big of a deal. So today we're going to be taking a look at a game called Nuns on the Run, which as you can see, I still have in my collection. So it's not like... I dislike the game anymore or not. But this is one of the few games in my top, uh, in my one hit wonders that has fallen down because I'm not as big of a fan of it as I once was. Now, I'll tell you this to be perfectly frank, the main reason it's in my collection still is because my daughter absolutely adores this game. Real quick, Nuns in a Run, each person is playing a young nun who's in a, in a, priory and you want to go get something at night, sneak out of your room at night, you're like going to find a love letter or some uh, potion or, or something, or you want to eat a piece of cake, you know, whatever. So you have to go get that and back. And another person is playing the uh, prioress and, and the abbess and they're walking around on these like predetermined paths and you're like sneaking around at night and they're trying to catch you and they might hear you and then when they hear you, they can deviate from their paths and if they see you, you know, they, they can chase you and catch you. And so it has this whole hidden movement thing where the other players, the different players are secretly moving their nuns on the board in different spots and the other person trying to catch them. And I really love the atmosphere, the feeling that this game gives. And when I played it, I was delighted. I played it multiple times and was, had fun every time. Now, as time has gone by, I have played a few games where it was almost impossible to catch one of the novices because she was able to sneak and get out and there was really nothing that the other player can do. 
And that was a little bit like, oh, come on now. There, there should have been at least a chance to have caught them other than, I mean, not even blind luck would have helped in some situations. And so it dropped a little for me. But when a game drops a little for me, it falls out of the top 100. It really, that, that's just how it works. Um, so my daughter still likes the game and I still like it. I do not dislike the game. I do not think it's a, a bad game at all. And I still think the theme is really fun and the idea is really fun. But there is the occasional game where it's almost like a non-game. Someone can get their, their piece of cake or whatever and get back and escape before the others catch them. So that's why Nuns and Run is no longer my top 100, but it is still a game that I've had a lot of fun with and obviously one that's still in my collection. <laughs> everyone, this is Scott Nicholson, and welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower, where I look ga at games and academia, because that's what I do. I'm an associate professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. And on this short episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about this book, which was a life-changing book for me, Punished by Rewards, by Alfie Cohen. Um, this book is a book I use as one of my textbooks in one of my classes called The Gamification Journey. And this book is all about all of the problems that rewards cause. Now, we have come very accustomed to using rewards in our society, that you do something for me and I give you a reward. As I've been talking about over my last few segments of talking about this idea of gamification, so much of that is tied into rewards, that we're going to use some sort of incentive to get you to do something. And um, Alfie Cohn explores in depth why this is bad and why offering rewards is bad. And it's all coming down to some theories that I'll talk about a little bit later on another segment of self-determination theory. But it comes down to these concepts, this concept that if I have a desire to do something and then I get a reward for doing it and that reward is ever taken away or I get tired of that reward, my desire to do that thing is going to be much less than when it started. It's the idea that if that these rewards replace my motivation to want to do something. And I've actually found this to be true in my life. You probably have, if you think about it, you probably find it to be true as well. Um, and grades are a great example. I've talked about that, that when you give someone once, w w before kids go to school, they want to learn a lot of stuff. They ask a lot of questions. They want to learn about the world. And then they start getting grades for learning. And you find pretty quickly it's, it can be hard to get them to explore and learn without grades. And it can take us a while once we get out of school to rekindle that love of learning, to get to that point again where we're ready to go back and learning. It, that, that can be, it can be challenging to do that. Um, and what he talks about, there's study after study. This book goes through hundreds of studies that show this pattern again and again in kids and adults. They found kids that, that like to do some kind of art. They picked out the kids who like to draw with magic markers. They then pull those kids out. They gave them rewards for drawing with magic markers. They then sent all the kids back into the space and observed them, and they saw that the kids that liked to draw with magic markers before did not return to the magic markers. They saw this with adults doing puzzles. They took some adults who, a bunch of adults that liked to do puzzles, split them in half, gave some of them rewards for doing puzzles, Other did, others didn't get rewards, and then looked at their behavior, and they saw the ones that got rewards were less likely to do puzzles. You see this again and again and again. And so... If you want to learn more about this, I only have a few minutes here. Take a look at this book, Punished by Rewards. It'll talk a lot about all the problems we have with rewards and some ways to get people to do things without rewards, where you try to get them motivated. But I'll talk about that on another episode of the Ivory Dice Tower. Till then, I'll talk to you later. Bye -bye. All right, folks, here are some games that you may see being reviewed this week. I know you're like, hey, I saw some of these games here several weeks in a row. Yeah, sometimes they just don't get reviewed. Um, but we have several different games here. The Battle for Souls from Robert Burks. That's one I'm hoping to get this week. Russian Railroads and Exodus Proxima Centauri. You should see Miami Dice reviews of those. This black box here. Um, well, look for this review coming out this week. This is one of the worst games ever designed in history. Um, you might even win an award for that. There are also going to be a lot of reviews for my contributors. And don't forget, of course, the Dice Tower itself. Me and Eric are back together. And so we will be putting out a show for you this Tuesday. And all our other podcasts, you can find things out at Dicetowernetwork.com. He's Tony. And he's Marty. And has this ever happened to you? I'm getting the hang of this game. I'm starting to really like this. I mean, what have you played this twice? I've played this a whole lot. You know, I got. So yeah, that first time didn't work for me, but uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm on this now. You know, 
You know, huh? Marty's still not gotten this. I, you know, picked this up at Gen Con. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's going to go on all night. I might have stopped. That's the really You know how it is. It's all good. They're always looking for their young ladies. No, he's not. He's in enough. Come on, man. Hey, stop. It's, it's your turn. turn. Just one second, you guys. Just, just one second. So what happened just now? Ugh, excessive phone usage at the table. Technology is great. It has its place at the gaming table, but not to the point it distracts or interferes with the game. Tabletop gaming is all about the face-to-face -face social interaction. Thus, constantly checking your cell phone can be distracting and even rude at times for those around you. However, there are times when using your phone is acceptable, such as looking up rules or FAQs on the game you are playing, tweeting out pictures of the game you're playing to your gaming friends, when you're contacted by your significant other, no, what? not even then, no, okay, not even. Um, ordering a copy of the game you are playing from Cool Stuff Inc., ordering pizza. Other than that, keep your phone in your pocket, muted. It's the polite thing to do. Dude. Meat lovers? Yeah. Hey folks, today in my thinking section, I want to take a look real quick at the latest and greatest fad in board gaming, and that is micro games. Micro games is essentially, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a a term that the companies who are selling them, this is almost exclusively a Kickstarter thing, um, the companies that are selling these micro games are promoting them as micro games. In the essence, a micro game is a really small game. Now, micro games is nothing absolutely new to the market. As I mean, years ago, decades ago, the, several war game companies uh, produced postcard games where there was a postcard and there was a game you could play on it. There have been games that have been released in magazines where you could open a magazine and there was some rules and stuff and so a few pieces for a game. So this is really nothing new, but it still is kind of the hotness today. And in fact, the, there's one game that's really kind of brought this to the forefront, and that company doesn't even call it a micro game, but it is obviously the one that's really propelled them forward, and that would be Love Letter from AEG. And obviously, that game has done well. I think it's in its uh, third or fourth edition at this point, and just doing phenomenally well, where it's just uh, several cards and a few cubes, and you can play the game. Now, the term micro games itself I think was brought to the forefront by Tasty Minstrel and they had Coin Age and they, they seem like they're putting one out every two or three weeks now. They said that I think they plan to have six or seven over the course of 2014 but they're not the only ones. Other companies have also come forward and put forth these small games. Now the purpose of this segment is not for me to, to come down and say that these games are bad or anything like that. That is not the case at all. I love Letter when I first played it. I was impressed that there was so much game in a small deck of cards. I am a little kind of like cynical in some aspects because one, I don't think the whole term micro game is really like that big of a deal. As I said, there have been these games out there before, and what exactly determines a micro game? I mean, I have these doors here that are full of little small games. And so, I mean, these things have existed for a while. But what attracts people to a micro game? I mean, at first it's the idea of like, wow, in this small package, there's a lot of game. Well, that is really the case. There is a lot of game for that small package, but it is still a small package. And usually the game that's in that small package isn't going to exceed the small package by that much. I think there are exceptions. I think Love Letter really has a decent amount of game in there. But at the same time, I don't invite people over for a night of playing Love Letter. Love Letter is just that game we say, ah, oh, you know, we got some free time here, let's play this game. And that's what micro games are good for, to play in between. I haven't played Coin Age yet, but I've gone over the rules and looked at it, and I've looked at a couple of the other uh, micro games that are on the market, and they look like they're interesting, fun little games to play between other games. I am kind of surprised that, you know, like the pricing of them, people are like, oh, well, they're so cheap, you know, they're five or six dollars. Well, that's fine, but I mean, if you multiplied that by 10 and paid $50 for another game, but you have 10 times the components, seems like it's the same thing to me. 
What I'm kind of surprised about is just really the excitement people want to have all these micro games and yet when I go to conventions and when I go to other places, I'm not seeing people playing these games all over the place. Now maybe that will change, but I strongly feel that this is a fad that's going to fade out. I mean, I think that it's, it's almost a marketing ploy by companies to say, hey, this is a micro game. Well, that's fantastic. And I'm, all, I'm certainly on board with playing some of these micro games. But folks, I like games with meat. I really do. And in the long run, a micro game is like eating a couple potato chips. It's delicious and entertaining, but it certainly can't be a meal for me. And that's how I feel about micro games. They're fun and entertaining, but man, they are a small part of my gaming diet. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I need my games to be three, four, five hours long and that I need them to be super rules heavy. But I do, well, let's just take a typical micro game and compare it to Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride is not a very complicated game, it has a few rules to it, has, but has a big board and lots of pieces. And when you bring it out, you feel like you're playing a game. A micro game has a few pieces and a few cards, and oh, I can play it on the airplane, I can pull it out at the airport, I can, I can play it at a lunch table with someone else, and that's fantastic. That's exactly what those are good for. So, what am I trying to say here? Well, like I said already, I think it's a fad, as most things in board games are, a trend, something that comes in and out uh, very quickly, but it will be interesting to see where we go in the future with these, and I think there will come at some point in the future where someone will go, Oh, come on, I want to play games that are big, and they'll, and they'll come out with these big games. People will be like, wow, it's about time we have some big games. All we have are these little micro games. Who knows? It's the upswings and downswings. But it certainly is interesting to watch, and either way, I certainly don't think they're bad for the hobby, so it'll be fun to see what's going to be the next big fad. Friends should help each other. Friends should be nice to each other, but let's face it, when you're at the gaming table, the gloves come off. The gaming table is the perfect place to be real jerks to your friends. And uh, today we're going to talk about one of the snake's favorites uh, that lets you really do that, and that is Revolution. Revolution is from Steve Jackson Games, it's by Philip DuBerry, and it is a great game for making secret plans uh, and just torpedoing your friends' hopes, dreams, and desires. There are three currencies in the game that you use to bribe, threaten, and blackmail the people who might otherwise give you support. Uh, there are 12 different people in the village that you can uh, attempt to take control of. Uh, and once everyone has chosen where to spend their different currencies, everyone reveals. And you compare, you find out who bribed or threatened the hardest on the general then the captain, then the innkeeper, and so on down the line. Players are trying to achieve support. That's their victory condition. Uh, and to do that, different, player, different people within the game will give you support. Others will give you influence, which comes in the form of these cubes that you place on the different places in the village. And if you control the most cubes in a particular area, say the market, or the harbor, or the fortress, at the end of the game, you're going to get even more support for having done that. Uh, this is a great game for people who like to bluff, who people like to uh, try to get inside their opponent's head and figure out what they're going to do uh, before they do. Uh, and it's a game for people who like political intrigue. Uh, here at the cafe, it has quickly become a favorite, uh, and it gets taken off the wall a whole lot. So. Next time you want to play a game where you get to be real jerks to your friends, try Revolution. Well, that's it for this time, folks. I hope you enjoyed watching Board Game Breakfast. There's a lot of exciting things coming out. I'll be doing, a, not this Thursday, but next Thursday, I'll be doing a Google Hangout with Terry from uh, the Geek and Sundry Vlogs. We'll be talking about Star Trek Attack Wing. Um, we have another top 10 list coming out for you this week, and hopefully, as I said, a pile of different reviews and things for you. It's going to be really interesting. Keep your eye out. The Dice Tower Awards nominations will be announced soon, not very soon, but in a few weeks. So that's coming up, and there's just a lot of exciting things coming our way soon. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching The Dice Tower, unless you like Kingdom Builder, in which case you probably aren't. To find out more about all of our podcasts, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. To see a listing of our videos, head to Dicetower.com. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Cool Stuff Incorporated, where you can buy games for great prices. Cool Stuff in Stock.